Well, thank you, Pastor, First Lady Height, for the invitation to come and speak the word of the Lord and celebrate with you 39 years of ministry and still going forward. That's an accomplishment. So, so good to be here. Roger, that was a great testimony, giving us the whole layout. I remember the old building. I'm as old as you, brother. I'm older than you, so. Been around for a while, but it's been, a, it's been great to, it's great to celebrate with you, and it's been great to see the church grow and develop over the years. But let's go right to the word of the Lord today. I, I had a number of different thoughts that came into my mind on what I should preach on as I was thinking about this over a couple of weeks. But I kept coming back to this message, and I think it's appropriate because we're celebrating your 39th year uh, in, uh, here at Waterbury. And so I wanted to preach on the church, the universal church, the body of Christ, the local assembly. Now, I don't have a text that I'm going to read to you this morning, but I have numerous verses that I'll be uh, sharing with you throughout the message. But let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be here, to share your word with your people, God. I pray that your word would go forth unto the unction, the anointing, the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, that it would find a fertile soil in our hearts, Lord. Lord, that your word would never return unto you void, that it would accomplish that for which you had set it forth to do. So God, I pray, bless your word. Bless both the speaker and the hearer, Lord God. And Father, we give you all the honor, all the glory, all the praise. And we ask everything in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can, amen. Thank you so much. God is good. Now, I'm sure every one of you know that the Greek word for church simply means called out. But the root of the word means uh, of or belonging to. The church has been called out of darkness into God's marvelous light that we can be of Christ, that we can belong to Christ. Some years ago, I put together a simple working definition of what the church should be. The church is a dynamic fellowship of the redeemed in Christ whose purpose and goal is to exalt our living head, the Lord Jesus, to edify and build one another in love and the most holy faith, and to proclaim his gospel of grace to a lost and dying world. Now allow me to break down that uh, definition in its component parts. The church is a dynamic fellowship. One of the definitions of the word dynamic is motion, that is the result of force producing or involving change or action. The church should be characterized by its energy, by its forcefulness. The church was conceived with great power on the day of Pentecost. Your pastor mentioned it this morning as 120 were baptized in the Holy Ghost. And, that, and the church should be God's agent of change in this world. That word dynamic means to bring about change. That change comes through forcefulness, and that should characterize the church. The, to, um, the church is a dynamic fellowship, a body of individuals joined together through common origins, beliefs, interests, experiences, and deeds, a community, a brotherhood, a people knit together having union and communion with Christ and with each other. The church is a dynamic fellowship of the redeemed in Christ, the people of every kindred, tribe, nation, and tongue, bought from the slave market of sin, translated into God's glorious kingdom, and transformed into a new creation, made the very righteousness of God, partakers of his divine nature, heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. Now, having said all that, I want to share with you a number of elements that will enable us to become that dynamic fellowship. And I don't care how dynamic we think we are, we can become more dynamic for the glory of God. So there are a few things that I want to uh, share with you. First and foremost, 
We need to be a grounded church, a grounded church. In 1 Timothy 3.15, the church of the living God is the pillar and the ground of truth. The church needs to uphold the truth. It needs to be grounded, settled, and established in the truth. What is truth? Well, the psalmist said, from the beginning, thy word is truth. Isaiah said, from on old, thy testimonies are faithfulness and they are truth. Jesus said, sanctify them with the truth. Thy word is truth. We need to be grounded, settled, firmly fixed in the word of the living God. And this is very, very critical because we have been prophetically warned in 1 Timothy uh, 3.15, that, um, excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, in 1 Timothy 4.1, we read, In the latter days, many shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. In 2 Timothy uh, 4.2, we read, Preach the word. He's being very emphatic. Preach the word. Your number one um, job to do for the church is to preach the word of the living God. He said, be ready in season, out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with long suffering and teaching for the time will come when they, the they there in context is not the heathen, it's not the pagan, it's not the atheist or the agnostic, it's God's covenant people. He said, preach the word because the time is going to come when God's people, now listen to what he says, when God's people, they will turn their ears from the truth and they shall be turned aside to follow fables. There's a double turning here. First, God's people will turn their ears from hearing the truth and then they're going to be changed to follow fables. Who's going to change them? Seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We need to be sure that we are settled, ground, established in the truth. In Acts 2.42, Dr. Luke says, they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread and prayers. Notice how Luke states it. We need to be steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. Apostles, plural. Doctrine, singular. There are many, many preachers, teachers, evangelists, prophets, and they all have a message. And very often that message is erroneous. God's people have to understand the word of the living God. We have to be established in it. Singular. Apostles, plural. Doctrine, singular, there's only one word of God. And in that Timothy, uh, the second Timothy text, we're told that we need to not only be steadfast in the word of God, we need to understand the word of God. We need to study the word of God. Uh, We need to fully comprehend the seriousness of Paul's words to the church at Ephesus. Just prior to Paul leaving the church of Ephesus, he was there for a number of years teaching and preaching the word of God. And in Acts chapter 20, listen to what he says. He says, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. He said, I gave you everything. I shared with you the full counsel of God, and there was a purpose behind that. He said, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to the flock of God among you, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this. Paul says, I'm persuaded about something. I taught you the word of God. I taught you everything that I know through revelation of the Holy Spirit, because I know something. I know something's going to take place. After my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things and draw away uh, disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember 
that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day. See, Paul knew false prophets, false preachers, false evangelists were going to invade the body of Christ, and they're going to preach all kinds of different things, and our near ears need to be open to hear the singular word of God. The singular word of God. And now Amos, in Amos chapter 8, verse 11, listen to what he says. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the word of the Lord. Now, Amos is not saying that there won't be preachers preaching the word, the true word of God. He didn't say that there wouldn't be evangelists preaching the word of God, the true word of God. What he's saying here is the famine is going to be that God's people will no longer want to hear the word of God. There's a big difference there. There'll be preachers preaching, but God's people will not be listening. You know, Isaiah, uh, Jesus quoted the prophet Isaiah. He says, having eyes to see, we see not. Having ears to hear, we hear not. Beloved, we need to be steadfast, unmovable, totally convinced in the scriptures. We need to prove all things. We need to try the spirits. We need to let the word of God dwell in our hearts richly. We need to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Listen, I don't care what order you put everything else I'm going to say to you today, but number one, number one, we have to be a grounded church. We have to be steadfast, grounded, firmly fixed in the word of the living God. Secondly, we must be a uh, gifted church, a gifted church. Ephesians 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. God has deposited every good and perfect gift into the church of Jesus Christ. Whether it's the gifts of men in Ephesians 5, the ascended Christ gave gifts unto the church. He gave gifts of um, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers or the charismatic gifts of the Holy Spirit, as he delineates for us in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 4 through 11. Paul tells us that there's a diversity of gifts, all given by the same Spirit. Every one of us has received something from God. We have all received a gift from God. And then he goes on and he tells us what some of these gifts are. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, hearing, miracles, prophecies, discerning of spirits, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Or if he's talking about the gifts as they appear in Romans 12, and verse, beginning with verse 6, since we have gifts that differ accordingly to the grace that is given to each of us. Do you hear that? God has given a gift to every one of us. I don't care if you're saved two days or 33 years. God has a special gift for you. And he goes on to talk about those gifts. He says, um, the grace given to each of us to exercise them accordingly, if prophecy according to the proportion of faith, if service in his service, in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without hypocrisy. The church should acknowledge these gifts. We should learn the proper usage of them. We should never abuse or misuse them. We should never neglect or ignore them. There are some denominations which say the gifts have ceased during the apostolic age. That is not true. I can prove that to you scripturally, but we don't have the time to do that today. Listen, it is understandable that Satan would try to cause us to abuse, misuse, ignore the gifts. And if he can convince us that these gifts aren't for you and I, then he is going to 
cause great difficulties as we engage in spiritual warfare in the heavenlies. So we need to earnestly seek the gifts. We need to pray that God would release the gifts into the body of Christ in a greater dimension than we've ever seen. God knows the day we live in, we need the power, the anointing, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be manifest throughout the body of Christ today. God has given you a gift, and if you have yet to realize what it is, then let 2022 be the year of discovery for you. And when you come into that gifting, use it properly. Use it that it will exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, that it will edify the body of Christ, that it will be a witness to this world that God is still on the throne and God is still a miraculous God. Do you believe that today? God is still a miraculous God. You heard a testimony of healing today. God is a miraculous God. Thirdly, we need to be a godly church. Remember the Greek word for church, called out? God has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. He has called us to be saints, sanctified, separate, holy unto God. In 2 Corinthians six seventeen. Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch the unclean, and I will receive you. I shall be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. But he who has called you is holy. You also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. 1 Peter 2, 9. But we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation that we may proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now listen, it is not easy living godly lives in a fallen and sinful world. Satan desires to sift anyone, every one of us like wheat. He desires to make war against the saints, to to wear us out, to wear us down, to cause spiritual fatigue in our lives. But in spite of all that, God has called us to be holy. You know, this world is beautiful. It truly is. It's, it bears the imprint of God. And I'm sure every one of us has experienced a, you know, a starry night sky. We have experienced a beautiful sunset, a beautiful sunrise. Um, we experience, you know, uh, uh, those wonderful snow-capped mountains, uh, the thunderous sound of a waterfall. This world is beautiful. There's no doubt about it. But this world is under a curse, a divine curse. And this world should never be our ultimate purpose or our ultimate goal. We're to walk circumspectly, pointedly, accurately with a definite goal in sight. And that goal is eternity with the eternal God. And we need to be a holy, set-apart people. It's not easy to be holy. And there's not a man or a woman sitting in this church today that does not have a besetting sin, a master sin, a sin that can so easily overtake us, and that is in the least expected moment. But in spite of all that, God wants us to be holy. What is holiness? Holiness is allowing the Spirit of God to conform us into the image and likeness of Christ. Holiness is not some legalistic puritanism that some profess to have but fall very short of, but yet judge people according to their standards, telling them whether or not they think they're holy or not. Holiness is allowing the spirit of the living God to conform us into Christ's likeness. That's holiness. You know, one time Jesus was asked a question, well, let me, let me back up. In uh, Ephesians chapter 1, Paul said this. He said, be followers of God and walk in love. I want you to stay with me here for a little bit. Be followers of God and walk in 
love. Jesus was asked a question. One of the lawyers came to him wanting to um, trip him up, cause him to say something he shouldn't say. And he asked him, he said, which is the great, greatest of all commandments? And Jesus responded, and you know the answer, right? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your energy. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Upon these two commandments hang all the law and all the prophets. Holiness is being conformed into the image of God, into the likeness of God. Jesus made a statement three different times in three different ways, but they all meant the same thing. He said, men will know that you are my disciples my disciples. Men will know that you're being conformed into my image, that you're walking in my ways, in my will, and in my word, that you keep my commandments, which are the great commandments. Love God, love your fellow man. Jesus said a second time, men will know that you are my disciples by the fruit that you bear. What is fruit? For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and so on and so forth. And then if we're just not getting it, you know, sometimes we're a little gabados, right? A little hard head. So he removes all the doubt. He says, men will know that you are my disciples, that you're being conformed into my image, that you're walking in my ways, my will, and my word, that you love one another. Holiness begins with love. Loving God loving each other, and loving the world. You know, Paul makes a statement in his uh, Galatian letter. He says that we're to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh, right? He says, because the spirit and the flesh are at war with each other, seeking dominance over each other. And then he goes on in that Galatian chapter to tell us what a walk in the spirit looks like. And he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Love is the premier fruit of the ninefold cluster of fruit. It's the predominant fruit in that ninefold cluster. Everything begins with love. Out of love flows joy. If you don't have love in your heart, I tell you this today, you have no real joy. What you have is moments of happiness. Happiness is the result of happy happenstances. When your circumstances are happy, you're happy. When your circumstances are ugly, you're no longer happy. But joy is something eternal, and uh, it's something that God puts deep in your heart, and it flows from a heart of love. Joy of the Lord is our strength. When we're loving God, when we're loving each other, and we're loving those that are hard, hard, hard to love, that's when God strengthens us. Joy, he gives us joy, and the joy of the Lord is our strength. And then comes peace, peace of mind, peace of heart, peace of mind that passes all understanding. Without the love of God, there's no real joy, and you have no real peace. You have momentary times of peace. Look at the world around you. Where's the peace in this world? Everybody's at war with each other. You can't even talk to people anymore. If you have a difference of opinion, you're, you're forget about it, you're cast out like you have leprosy or something. Look at our nation today. Our nation is in trouble today. My goodness, our leaders are in trouble today. Nobody knows what they're doing and the... Our nation is so full of crime, hatred, bitterness. My goodness, we need the love of God to be manifest in our heart. We have to learn how to love people. We have to learn how to love people that we don't like. And that's what Jesus really meant in that uh, statement, love your neighbor as yourself, because he was talking about the Samaritans. The Jews hated the Samaritans. They thought they were a mongrel race. They were less than no, these are the people we have to learn how to love. We have to learn how to talk with. And then flowing out of uh, the peace of God comes kindness. 
Something's missing in our country today. Kindness. The, our lips, uh, from our lips should flow the fruit of kindness. We have to learn how to be kind again. My goodness. Look what's happening in our country today. Mass shootings. Crime is at all times high. People can't even look at each other. We speak ill of each other. We curse those in authority. My goodness, you know, the Michael the archangel never used an accusatory word against the worst of the worst, Satan. But yet, so easily, the church can use unkind words about people and those in authority. We need to pray for them. We need to show the love of God. We need to have that love manifested. And I could stay here for two years. I need to move on. Because without love, we have nothing. Nothing. We need to be a grateful church. One of the signs of the last days is the sign of apostasy, which is ungratefulness. You can read about that in 2 Timothy chapter 3. So what's the antithesis of unthankfulness? It's gratefulness, being grateful, giving God thanks, being grateful for the big things, the little things, thanking God for his greatest of all gifts, the gifts of salvation, his unspeakable gift, thanking him for his mercies that are renewed every morning, for great is his faithfulness, thankful for the grace that his grace abounds, his love is everlasting, that he is our shield, our protector, that he is our high tower, the lifter of our head, thankful that he's for us and not against us, thankful that every weapon formed against the church will not prosper, and every tongue that rises against us in judgment shall be condemned thankful that we have been justified by faith. We have access wherein we stand, that we can come boldly unto the throne of grace to find grace and mercy to help in the hour of our need. Thankful that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, that we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Psalm 100, I'm sure you all know it. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, <clears throat> his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. A grateful church, a thankful church, thankful for everything that God has done for us in the past, like taking a, a few Italian immigrants and seeing the church evolve over the years, and 39 years later, you got this great church, a great building, great people. Thankful for God for his faithfulness throughout all generations. We need to be a grateful church, thanking God for each other, thanking God for everything that he does. Fifthly, we need to be a going church. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. The church needs to be evangelical. That's your name, Evangelical Christian Church of Waterbury. We need to be evangelical. We need to get the message out that God loves the human family, that God wants to save men and women, that God wants to make the best of men and women. He wants to transform our lives. We have a message, a message that can transform people, a message that gives us strength, hope, and vitality. We have a message to share with the people. You know, one day Jesus wanted to leave Judea and go to Galilee. And he said, listen, I have to go through Samaria. That must have taken the, the apostles aback a little bit. Go through Samaria. No good Jew wants to go through Samaria. They hated the Samaritans. They were a mongrel race. They considered them less than. But Jesus said, I must go through Samaria. But wait a minute, Lord, there's two alternate routes. You don't have to go through Samaria. I have business there. I have kingdom business there. I have a flock that you know nothing of, talking about not only the Samaritans, but every Gentile person. The gospel is to all people, every kindred, every tribe, every tongue. It doesn't matter our race, our ethnicity, our color. God loves people. He's a people person. 
And you and I, we need to be people persons. I don't know if that's proper English, but that's okay. We'll say it anyway. You know, we need to be like that church in Thessalonica. You know, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, he says, And you became followers of us and the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit. You can have joy even if you're afflicted. You can have joy even if you're suffering with pain every day because joy is a result of love, the love that God puts in our hearts shed by the Holy Ghost. Where was I now? Okay, here we go. So that you were examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believed. From you the word of the Lord was sounded out in Macedonia, Achaia, and in every place your faith toward God has gone so that we need say nothing. That little phrase there, and the word was sounded out. It paints a word picture. It's like the blast of a trumpet. The blast of a trumpet is uh, clear. It's distinct. Our message needs to be clear. It needs to be understandable. You know, when I first got saved, I thought who I was. You know, I was this high hot shot that knew everything, and, and I used to try to tell people when I witnessed to them, you know, I would take them back to the Old Testament tabernacle and show them all the, sim, uh, the symbols in the Old Testament and everything, trying to show them Christ. And I, my witness wasn't going anywhere. No, everybody was looking at me like I had seven heads. So I went to my Sunday school teacher, and I said, Brother Lou, I said, what's wrong? I, I'm pouring my whole heart. I'm witnessing to people. And, and, and you know, and I told him my, my strategy. And he says, because you need to key, you need to use the KISS system. And I said, the KISS system? He said, yeah, keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> That's what he said to me. But, but a light went off. Keep it. Our message needs to be clear. We don't have to show everybody that we're, you know, a doctor of divinity. Keep the message clear. Let it be distinct, understandable. The blast of a trumpet is loud. And I'm not talking about in your face loud. You know, sometimes people witness, they get up in somebody's grill, you know, and, and, and they're almost nasty in their, in, in their witness. No, loud, loud with boldness, willing to give an answer to any man who asks with, the, with grace and, and love in our hearts. Our message needs to be distinct. It needs to be uh, bold. The blast of a trumpet is musical. It's musical. It's music. Sometimes we witness to people and we look like we sucked on a bag of lemons. Who are you going to save looking, you know, frowning all the time? Never, never showing the joy of the Lord. You talk to some people and they say, you got the joy of the Lord, brother? They say, oh, yeah, glory to God, I got the joy of the Lord. Well, put a smile on your face. Get a song in your heart. Put a little twinkle in your eyes. Get a glide in your stride and a little hop in your bop. At 73 years old, I could still jump. Want to see it again? Don't say yes because that hurt way too much. True story. It's music. Smile. Show people you, you have the joy of the Lord in your heart. Then they may listen. You know, in Song of Solomon, chapter 4, after um, Solomon is describing his sister, his spouse, his bride, uh, he, you know, with very metaphorical language, uh, uh, a, fount, um, a garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a, a fountain sealed, and then he, he names all the herbs and the spices of the garden. Uh, and then in verse 16, he says this, Come, O north wind, and south blow on my garden why so that the breath of the holy spirit can take all those spices all those fragrances and lift them over the walls of the garden out into the entire world our message needs to be sweet 
Yes, it needs to be clear, it needs to be loud, but it needs to be sweet. We need to let people know there's a God who loves them. Sixthly, we need to be, a, I'm going to be real quick now, um, we need to be a growing church. Now, I'm not only talking about growing numerically. Of course we want to grow numerically. When a church is growing numerically, there are more hands uh, to help carry the load. Numerical growth means more gifts discovered and used that will impact lives. It means greater revenues to the church, but we need to be growing, growing in knowledge, growing in wisdom, growing in fruitfulness. These are the things that brings God gro uh, glory. You know, you can grow old, but never grow up. You could be saved 20, 30, 40, 60 years. I missed a 50 in there, right? 20, 40, 50, 60 years. Sometimes my mind still, uh, you know, drifts away on me, but that's okay. You can grow old, but never grow up. You know, Jesus in John 15 said, you have not called me, but I have called you. And I have ordained that you would bear fruit, that you would grow up in me, that you would mature in me. Mature Christians become uh, useful uh, Christians. They become more pliable to the things of God, more uh, willing to share the love of God. And if we are a um, well, let me move on to number seven here because I've taken a lot of your time here. And maybe I should have saved this and put it somewhere in the middle because I don't want anybody to go home mad at me. Okay? We need to be a giving church. A giving church. You know, uh, Dr. Luke reminds us in the book of Acts that Jesus said it's, more, uh, it's better to give than to receive. In Luke chapter 6, verse 38, it will, um, give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, for the standard of measure will be measured to you in return. As we give, God gives unto us. Now, you know, I, I had the privilege and the, the honor to pastor my church for 35 years, almost 35 years. And from its inception, we were a giving church. And under the new pastor, we're still a giving church. And that's a blessing. But you know, you can be part of a giving church. And I'm sure that Waterbury uh, Christian Evangel uh, Evangelical Christian Church of Waterbury is a giving church. However, you could be part of a great giving church and not be a giving saint. Don't be satisfied with reaping the benefits of a giving church, but yet not a partaker or a participant, rather, in giving to the work of God. You know, I, it's sad that over the years of ministry, that I've come to understand that you could be part of a giving church, but yet the people are not giving people. That most of the burden falls on a handful of people. Others satisfy reaping all the benefits, but they don't give to promote the church, to meet the needs of the church and the people. I know people that have been saved 40 years and their wallet and their pocketbook have still yet to get saved. True story. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share that with you. I, I've never did this one time. I did this in my entire 34 years of, of ministry. I have never checked on how much people gave or how much they didn't give, because I did never wanted to be um, guilty of ministering to a person based on their financial giving. I wanted to have a clear conscience before God. But one day, a brother approached me, and this was in, in our inception, inception of the church. We, were, we existed for a year, 
and a brother came to me, and he, he had a burden for the abortion issue in America, and this is going back a time, and he came to me, he says, Pastor, we need to take a full page ad, color ad, uh, speaking against abortion, and I said, brother, there's like 25 people here, we can't afford to take a full time ad, and this is what he said to me, oh, I mean, as long as you get your paycheck, it's okay, but we, we are not going to give to something that's very important. I said, brother, there's been weeks I never got a paycheck. So he, he got me a little upset. I wanted to punch him in the nose, to tell you the truth, you know, really. You know, I wasn't that spiritual back then. L love was still growing because I wanted to punch that guy right between his eyes. So I went to my treasurer and I said, I want to know, this was in the summer months, it was June or July, and I said, I want to know how much this brother has given. Just give me from January to date. $75. $75. And he's asking me to take out a $700 uh, advertisement. But he wasn't willing to put a penny into it. So you could be part of a giving church, but not being a giving saint. God has blessed us. We need to bless others. We need to give because God is a great giver and you can never outgive God. And if we're trusting him, then we can give graciously to the work of God. Yes, the church is a dynamic fellowship of the redeemed in Christ whose purpose and goal is to exalt our living head, to build and edify each other, and to win the loss. And we can do it, but we need to be a grounded church, a gifted church, a godly church, a grateful church, a going church, a growing church, and a giving church. Together, if we do these things, we can reach our full potential as a church. And I said we, I'm not part of this church, but we, the body of Christ, can rise to a greater than what we think our potential is because God is always greater than anything we do, anything we try to do. So thank you for listening today. I hope something I said was beneficial to you and it's been such a wonderful pleasure uh, to be here today and to get together with you later and break bread with you uh, and celebrate your 39 years of ministry. That's a milestone. That's a great thing. So, Pastor, would you come close out the service for us? Thank you for listening to the teaching from the Word of God. My name is Paul Height. I'm the pastor of Evangelical Christian Church located at 1325 Watertown Ave in Waterbury, Connecticut. We would love to have you join us and worship Jesus Christ this coming Sunday at 1030. Now may God bless you, and may he continue to cause you to grow in the grace and the knowledge of his Son, Jesus Christ.